Okay, hi, welcome everybody to this first uh, screencast of Phonetics 1. Um, given the situation, we will probably record the next couple of sessions and uh, give you some time to adjust to the new situation. So, whatever I'm doing won't be perfect probably, but uh, for the next two or three sessions, which are quite technical, I assume that some visuals to help you go through the contents would actually be um, very helpful. So after the next two sessions or three sessions, we'll see and revise and then move on probably more to the forum and discuss things as they go along. Okay, so s things are changing so quickly and we have to adapt to the new situation, but rest assured, we will make this work and the semester will go ahead um, in a slightly different format, but uh, we will make everything um, as easy as possible for you. Right, so um, obviously my um, office hours are suspended, um, but if you have questions, please do not hesitate to ask. I might be a bit slower in responding to emails, but um, we'll get you there. Also, um, the way this is going to work is that I upload this video and um, you can watch the video during normal class hours. I'm planning to record about 30 minutes. Um, so what would normally be a 90 minute session, I try to record it in 30 minutes so you can um, then go back to the exercises. And uh, yeah, so during normal class hours, I will also be in the course chat. So if you um, go on to uh, the All At class, uh, there is the course chat. Um, if you activate this, a little window will pop open. So during normal class hours, I'll be in the chat to answer your questions while you'll be going through um, the exercises and um, homework. Okay, so we will um, start with phonetics uh, this week. And um, yeah, this is quite technical, um, but you had some experience with linguistics already, so this should not come um, as a major shock. But it is sometimes a bit unintuitive. Um, so I'll walk you through um, the phonetics. Uh, one, we'll talk about um, the consonants today. <coughs> okay, what is phonetics? Well, phonetics is the study of sounds, and we can distinguish three areas, articulatory phonetics, uh, sound production, articulation, um, acoustic phonetics, that's the actual physical properties of sound, right? So sound is comes in waves, so to speak. And um, you may have seen these spectrograms, right? So we can actually visualize um, sound as well. And here is an example um, of someone saying uh, the phrase, I hang those keys on a hook. Um, so different sounds will have different physical properties. Um, it has to do with frequency and energy um, that is expressed. And uh, so, yeah, we, we can record them and make them uh, visible. So we won't go too much into detail with these um, spectrograms, but um, if you uh, want to look this up, uh, feel free to. Okay, and the third um, area is auditory phonetics. That means um, sound perception and uh, processing. How do we recognize sounds as belonging to language or as some other uh, sounds? There's a whole field um, out there as well. Okay, we'll focus on articulatory phonetics and um, basically look at what types of speech sounds uh, do we have relative to language, they're language specific, but they're also uh, at some general properties. How can we describe the difference between the sounds and which criteria do you use to d distinguish um, the sounds? So we won't go too much into detail with um, any of the others and articulatory phonetics will also be um, rather, um, n well, not limited, but um, sort of ba basically the overview that complements the readings. Okay, so for the next uh, three sessions, today we'll talk about basics of uh, phonetics and artic articulation, and we'll talk about the consonants um, as well, and then have a first um, exercise in um, consonant transcription. Next week we'll talk about the vowels, um, how they differ from cons uh, consonants, and we will then also do um, vowel transcriptions um, together with the consonant transcriptions, so that you're able to read um, and write uh, in phonetic transcription. 
I'm not too sure what we're going to do in the third session yet. Um, we've called this applications. Um, so how do we apply our knowledge to, um, to other fields? Um, and I'm probably going to talk about um, background information to phonetics, sort of go into phonology a bit. Um, so all the sounds that we describe over the next couple of weeks, how do we know that these are the sounds of English? So we talk about phonemes and allophones and then do some um, additional transcription exercises. So I'll probably keep this um, within the field rather than going beyond, um, primarily because this is a new situation and uh, it might be more helpful to have additional exercises um, rather than some uh, new topic. But I will point out some applications, especially in uh, sociolinguistics and uh, perhaps in, um, in, uh, in other areas of um, uh, language acquisition, for instance. Okay, what are the objectives for today's session? Um, I want you to understand, or basically by the end of the session, you should be able to understand the basics of articulatory phonetics. Um, you should also be able to describe the articulators in consonant production, um, then apply the terminology to describe the English consonants and identify and distinguish between different types and classes of consonants. Uh, you should be able to master consonant transcription and have a basic understanding of the international phonetic alphabet. And also that's sort of a bit of a, 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 a general rule um, or sort of a, a general uh, approach that you should understand the mismatch between orthography and pronunciation and understand the motivation while we're using um, IPA. So there is a common um, intuition, uh, or there's a common mistake that people tend to mix up letters with sounds, and um, because it is at least in our Western society, we have this very strong fixation on uh, the written language. So um, we try to break up that there is um, not a direct link between writing and um, speaking, and that especially applies to English, of course, where orthography is quite messy. So by the end of um, the next two sessions, uh, you should be able to understand why English is actually so weird in, um, uh, in that mismatch between orthography and um, pronunciation. It has historical reasons. I'll come back to that next week. But um, also bear in mind that generally trying to keep it separate, speech and writing, um, is, is, is a general um, uh, thing that you need to train. Okay, so um, so let's start with exactly that, orthography versus pronunciation. Now, if you did a little exercise that I um, put up on OLAT beforehand, um, I asked you to come up with uh, different spellings for the same sound or different sounds for uh, one uh, particular spelling. So if you haven't done that exercise yet, you can pause the video and try and see how many different sounds uh, versus how many different spellings you come up with. Okay, so if you're back um, for the first part, um, different spellings for the same sound, um, like the E, we can actually come up with up to 11 uh, uh, different uh, spellings for that particular uh, sound. So there is um, this well-known fact that English is um, very poor in the matching between um, orthography and pronunciation, and for different sounds for the same spelling, uh, we have, well, at least um, six sounds that are represented by this one um, spelling. So orthography is a very poor predictor of pronunciation, especially um, in English. So uh, we also have, um, of course, in English, we have um, silent and missing letters, uh, like the K in no is not pronounced, and the um, H in honest um, is not pronounced, and the B in debt, uh, and so on. So we have um, Sometimes for historical reasons, again, we have um, this mismatch in orthography versus pronunciation. And then um, also we have some conventionalized, especially over the last uh, few years, we have some conventionalized um, orthography where there is um, even less of uh, a match between uh, writing and uh, speaking. Okay, one um, for the notation. Um, sometimes when we, especially when it's ambiguous, right, we use um, square brackets or slanted brackets when we refer to pronunciation. 
and we use uh, these angled brackets uh, when we want to make clear that we're talking about orthography here. So uh, sometimes they're left out if it's not ambiguous, if it's clear that you're talking about a sound, um, the square brackets or the slant of brackets won't be uh, required. Um, but if you do, uh, that's sort of the convention that we use to disambiguate between different um, uh, levels of reference. Okay, what the difference is between the um, square bracket and the angled brackets, we come back to in two weeks' time. It sort of goes a bit into uh, phonology as well. Okay, so the speech organs, um, very briefly, um, when we talk about articulatory phonetics, we talk about where um, this the airflow that comes out in your speech activity it comes out from um, through your lungs, uh, from your lungs through um, uh, through your head. Basically, uh, we talk about modulation of the airstream. Now we need um, some biological concepts and biological terms to describe where this airflow is modified and. Um, we can basically group them into uh, several areas. So alveolar ridge, that's right behind uh, your teeth. You have the heart palate, it's sort of slightly uh, towards the back, and then your um, uh, velum, your soft palate, towards um, the back of your mouth. We have sort of um, speech articulators or places of um, articulation that are in, uh, in your throat. And we also have them down in uh, your larynx. Uh, basically, your vocal cords and folds would be uh, uh, down there. They're quite um, relevant for uh, speech articulation. So sometimes, or um, we can, what well we can distinguish between um, the secondary speech articulators. They're usually not active in that sense, and a primary articulator, the tongue. Uh, so I haven't um, marked it down here in particular, but the tongue is sort of the major um, or primary articulator. And we want to describe um, where airflow is, is restricted and where articulators meet, basically. So that's um, our primary um, area. So um, we'll basically what we need this um, terminology because we want to make precise statements about the production of sounds, right? So um, we saw before that letters don't give us any indication. Um, so we need some terminology to describe exactly what happens uh, when we uh, describe the production of sound. Now that um, knowledge is also very handy for phonology and beyond. So um, if you, uh, for instance, if you want to know, or if you want to tell uh, or advise some uh, learners of English how to produce a certain sound that they might find difficult to produce because their L1 doesn't have it, um, that's where this knowledge uh, comes in very handy. Uh, the terminology also comes in handy if you look at uh, varieties of English, for instance, if you want to describe the differences uh, between uh, different writings and how to pronounce uh, certain words. Okay, so if we start then, think about what the difference is between um, the underlined uh, or the sounds that represent the underlined uh, letters. So rip, dip and zip. Right, so they've dip produced um, uh, slightly differently um, in uh, in where they're produced and how they're produced. So uh, rip and zip, uh, there is still air uh, coming through, right? So the airflow is not completely obstructed. Whereas with dip and zip, you have a complete uh, stop in d with the d, dip, uh, but not in uh, zip. And also notice that when you produce d and z, uh, you would also move your tongue slightly. Uh, so there are differences in uh, where you produce them and how you uh, produce them. Okay, so today we talk about the consonants and uh, one of the first distinctions that we uh, make here is the difference between the consonants and the vowels. Now, a lot of people would probably think that um, the difference is the vowels are R, E, E, O, U. Well, that's 
sort of uh, correct, but that's the letters we refer to, right? The, the, the vowel letters. Now, obviously, we have more um, vowels, and also that's not a definition, that's sort of a description. So what would be a definition to distinguish between uh, consonants and vowels is that we could say, well, with the consonants, you have obstruction of airflow, right? So tongue modulates uh, your airflow, either restricts it or completely blocks it. And with the vowels, we do not have um, the obstruction of um, airflow. So that's a first um, ap approximation, so it's not quite that simple. Um, and we also see that distinction between vowels and consonants, um, even if we do have this, um, this definition or this observation, um, it's not quite that um, simple. But let's um, keep it with that for the time being. Okay, so if we talk about the consonants, now we talk about the obstruction of airflow, where it happens and how it happens. So where um, we can uh, distinguish um, certain classes of um, consonants in um, that we generally classify consonants in terms of either produced at the lips um, or with the lips and the teeth. So p, b, m and w are called bilabial because you need both lips to produce them. Th and V um, are called labidentals uh, because you use uh, your lip and um, your upper teeth. Teeth only um, are so-called dental sounds, the infamous uh, TH sound in English, which comes in, um <coughs> in a pair. We'll talk about that in a second. Then we have the alveolar ridge. It's sort of your little that little hump behind your teeth. Uh, so for anything t, d, n, s, s, z, u, uh, r, that's where you um, touch the upper part um, with your tongue. Slightly further to the back, you will have the palate or alveolar um, area. So the sounds produced there would be called post alveola or palato alveola. There's a bit of a uh, terminological. Um, not confusion, but people call it differently. And you notice that difference if you try to say t and sh, t, sh, t, sh, you may notice that your tongue is going further to the back for the sh sound and it's further to the front for the t. Then we have a uh, palatal sound, um, the y, right? So if you produce y, y, your, your, your tongue's sort of moving up towards um, the palate. Now, we can already see that we're not either obstructing or blocking um, the airstream. So the year is a particularly, um, a bit of an exception, or is sort of uh, not as uh, consonancy as, as would be the rest. <coughs> right, and then we have the um, soft palate, um, the velum, that's where your tongue sort of moves upwards to produce k, g, and n. Right, so especially with the ong, um, if you overdo it, uh, you notice that there is this ong vila uh, sound. And then um, I have it down here as a glottal, uh, glottal uh, sound. The h is uh, sort of produced down um, down your throat in in the larynx. Okay, so um, we've covered the where, and then uh, we quickly go through the how. If um, these sounds are produced in the same place, how do they differ? So these two pair, t, s, b, m, z, n, right? So t, s are both produced um, at the alveolar ridge behind your teeth. B, m, both bilabial, z, n. Same story, right? But we see um, that they differ in how they're produced, like in their manner of um, articulation. So t is like a complete stop of air, s, so where still um, air passes through, so it's a bit of a hissing sound. Um, with b, air flow is completely stopped. M, airflow is also stopped, but it sort of escapes through uh, the nose. That's what we call it a nasal. We'll come to that in a second. Um, so we see that even though uh, they're produced in the same place, they're produced in a different manner, quite simply. So here we um, classify by how far or how much the airflow 
is obstructed. So with the plosives, um, airflow is completely stopped. P, b, t, d, k, g. So there is uh, a stoppage and then a sudden release um, of air. We have fricatives where the articulate has come very close, but there is um, airflow going through, a bit of creating this hissing sound, right? The friction. And her. Right? So we could be keep going on uh, doing the sound for quite some time, uh, which is something you can't do uh, with, uh, with the plosives, right? Sort of plosives um, will be produced very quickly. Then we have a class of so-called affricates. Um, in English, they're ch and j. That means it's a, plos a combination of a plosive plus a homoorganic fricative. Now, homoorganic means produced in the same place, right? So the t and the sh, they're produced in, well, technically in different places, right? Palatal and um, post alveolar. But these are very, very close. Uh, so homoorganics are kind of produced are in, in, in very close um, space. The so one question obviously would be why do we consider them one sound and not two sounds? That is phonological reasons and we come back to them in three weeks. Then we have the nasals, um, as I said before, that's anything that goes through the nose. So for English that would be hm, n, and hm. Right, so the airflow in your oral cavity is completely blocked, but it escapes um, through the nose. Then we have a class of approximants. So now, um, if we remember the situation we had with the y, um, approximants are those that where articulators approximate each other, right? So there's no friction and there is no stoppage. Um, there's just approximation. So that's a first indication that our distinction between consonants and vowels is um, more categorical probably or more binary um, than 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 in, in in reality or that that we, we actually have more of a continuum rather than um, categorical um, distinction so if pairs of sounds are produced in the same place and in the same manner, how can we describe the difference between them? What's the, what distinguishes um, them? So p and b, both plosives, both produced with the lips, f and v, both labiodental, both fricatives, and th, v, both fricatives and both interdental. So um, you probably have noticed um, that they differ in how um, how much volume comes out, uh, right? So we could uh, say that um, so if you also touch your, um, your your larynx while producing them, you can feel your vocal cords um, vibrating for uh, one um, sound of the of each pair. So p and b, so with b bit difficult to to feel for the plosives but you can feel it when you do f and v right so that's uh, when your vocal folds are vibrating so we distinguish them here between um, being voiceless when the vocal folds are not vibrating and voiced um, if they are uh, vibrating so more technical we uh, technically we would say they differ in voicing okay so um, to sum up, pr in a preliminary um, summary, we can classify and describe the consonants in uh, terms of voicing, voiceless or voiced, where they're produced, and how they're produced. So we can describe as a um, voiceless labiodental fricative. D is a voiced alveolar plosive and so on and so forth, right? So you can do that for every sound and each of these, uh, each of their values on these um, three dimensions would give it a unique name, so to speak. Okay, so one of the um, overviews that you may have come across is the so-called IPA chart. chart. Um, so how do we represent um, these sounds? And the International Phonetics Association has come up with um, the 
IPA alphabet that you may have may have seen uh, um, flying around, um, which sort of charts the entire um, or the, the possibilities of sounds that we can produce um, and that are actually um, attested, right? So if you look at this chart, uh, what it basically means is it gives us um, uh, what the sounds of English and it also gives us the place of articulation and the manner of articulation. And um, if you uh, look closely, if you um, sort of, you may have noticed that um, the bilabial plosives, um, that this is also kind of mirrors the area, sort of your, your oral cavity that we've um, shown you as well. So uh, with the left side being towards the front of your um, mouth and the right side being sort of towards um, the back as well. Now in this chart, um, the white areas are those um, combinations that are thought to be possible but that haven't been attested in languages around the world, whereas the gray areas, they're deemed physically impossible to produce. Uh, so labiodental lateral fricative apparently is deemed impossible uh, to produce. So for English, we'll um, make do with a slightly simpler uh, variety, but it's basically the same, uh, just some fields are crossed out that English um, doesn't use. Now there are a couple of um, visualizations online that you may want to um, try out. Um, I particularly like this um, up here. Now unfortunately, um, Adobe Flash will be uh, discontinued, um, but for now it is still um, available. So if you want to go down here and click, uh, you can select your language. You can also um, check, um, check this out for German. And then um, some nice um, animation here that illustrates uh, the sound um, production. Uh, so we have um, a consonant. You can um, select your uh, manner and place and voicing. Um, so if we go into manner and look at the uh, fricatives, uh, you can select your sound. And they will actually play you a little clip and how the tongue moves uh, when uh, you produce that sound. <laughs> right, so notice there was no action down here in uh, the vocal cord, but if you go to the um, other pair, uh, you'd have the same kind of uh, production, but with the vocal uh, folds. <laughs> right. The. Right, so what you've noticed in uh, the production of these sounds is that you may have noticed that the velum sort of uplifts uh, because the air is escaping through um, the oral cavity. But if you go to the nasals, you'll notice that it, the velum is lowered while mm. the production happens, right? So it goes through um, the nasal cavity. Okay, do we have um interesting... Cha. Right. I mean, you can play around with this. Ja. Um, it's quite intuitive. It's quite um, illustrative of how we produce uh, sounds. Okay, so the um, uh, other parts that you, you may want to look up is um, IPA charts. And again, um, these are all probably going to be discontinued by the end of the year, so be quick. So, um, Play around with this, uh, basically, especially with the sounds that English doesn't have. So, for instance, we have um, our bilabials here, right? Ba, aba, ab, ab. Ma, ama, am. And then we have some sounds that English doesn't have, but uh, for instance, you have a bilabial trill. Bra, abra, abr. Okay, so some languages use these sounds. And uh, yeah, if you go towards the back and if you play this at home, make sure that either your flatmates are out of the house or uh, turn down the volume. Ha, aha, ah. Right, sort of very, a lot of activity going on here. Ha, aha, ah. And that should give you some indication why the number of gray areas is uh, a lot higher towards um, the back of and, and your throat 
uh, basically because these would be um, impossible to produce. Okay, so uh, yep, check this out. Um, it's uh, we'll come back to the IPA chart next week, um, but there should be uh, some interesting stuff for you to um, to explore. Okay, so what we've done um, in the last half hour is um, tease apart orthography and pronunciation, right? So this is very <laughs> important that you keep them strictly apart. Uh, in saying you talk about sounds or do you talk about uh, letters. So mostly in linguistics, obviously, we talk about um, the sounds. You have come across um, s ways of classifying uh, speech sounds where we um, took a basic uh, look at uh, the consonants, which we described in terms of voicing, place and manner of articulation. You can now describe the English consonant um, inventory and put them into different classes, whether they're fricatives, plus minus fricative, right? Plosives, plus minus plosives. We've um, gone through that combination analysis before. Um, liquids, nasals, um, and you can also classify them um, by place of articulation um, as well. So this might come in handy at some point um, where you need to distinguish uh, certain sounds. One um, piece of advice as well is that the literature on or the terminology on um, sounds is more or less standardized but you will find occasional differences. Um, it's mostly a difference between um, American and European linguistics so um, Americans tend to speak of stops whereas Europeans tend to speak of plosives but they more or less always refer to the same uh, thing so it's just different terminology for historical reasons. Okay, so next week we'll talk about the vowel inventory and do um, more transcription um, exercises. Okay, that's me for now. Um, see you in the chat later on um, and also see you in the forum. Okay, so we can make this work if you contribute. Um, we'll be more successful the more you contribute uh, to that. And again, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, until then, stay safe, stay sane and stay home. Bye.